Hey, uh, it's me, Mr. Auerbach, here for environmental science class on Monday. And I uh, forgot to record during class, so here I am making a quick screencast for you of what we talked about today, science-wise. We talked about the nuclear fuel cycle, which is the, um, the way that we get from, uh, let me show you, uh, from the uranium in the ground all the way around to the uranium that is used in power plants, and then finally the uh, ultimate disposition of the waste products. So, right, when, when you dig the uranium out of the ground, it is not in a form that can be used. It is, um, well, the formula isn't here. Let me uh, type it out here. It's it's U308. Well, there it is in the, in the next step, but U308. Sorry, I cannot subscript that properly. But that is not anything like what you could put in a nuclear power plant. A lot of steps have to happen before you can do that. And first thing is that you do what's done with almost any ore of a metal that you want, which is you crush it up as fine as you can with giant machines. And then uh, after you've pulverized it, you treat it with acid or some other reactive chemical. In gold mining, you use cyanide solution, of all things, uh, and but the metal will react uh, with the acid and will be carried away in a liquid form. And then when it's separated out from the slurry of the, the crushed rock, it is then reconcentrated through chemical or electrical processes into what's called yellow cake uranium, which is this stuff here. And... Uh, it is also U308, but it is now not just little dots here and there in the uh, rock. It is uh, a more pure form. Still not usable in a nuclear power plant, but now for a different reason, sort of. Uh, it's more concentrated into a purified form, but it still isn't concentrated enough as far as the uh, isotopes that will fission. Remember that... Uh, uranium 235 which will fission is less than whoop, come on now is less than one percent of a sample whereas you need it to be oh right you need it to be five percent for power and the rest Almost all of the rest is uranium-238. Now, of course, I, I talked about this in the thing last week, so I'm not going to go through the whole process. But just as a reminder, that's why this next step happens, which is the enrichment. That's what you see over here. Um, there's two steps to enriching. The first thing is that you take the, the, uner the uranium oxide and you convert it into uranium hexafluoride only because it's a gas. You need it to be in gaseous form to do the gaseous diffusion process. Uh, interestingly, I was just in Paducah, Kentucky, which is where America's gaseous diffusion plant is or was uh, one of the, the main ones. I'll have more to say about that later in the course. But anyway, uh, they turn it into a gas and they put it through the centrifuges uh, and they enrich it, at which point they have enriched UF6, which then has to get converted to uh, uranium oxide, UO2, so not back to. Uh, let me correct that. It needs to be converted to uranium oxide. And then it's turned into fuel pellets. Let me just grow this real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. That's a uranium fuel pellet there held between the fingers. Oddly enough, that's not an unsafe thing to do. Don't. Uh, it's okay. But that is a, it's not pure uranium, uranium metal. It's a pellet that's uh, composed of a ceramic matrix with the uh, uranium oxide or U2, yeah, the uranium oxide embedded in it. In a matrix, and then you can see that that's uh, may fabricated into a larger rod, into a 
a longer uh, rod and then the actual fuel rod assembly of which let me see here i have a picture yeah here's uh this is one of those assemblies here being loaded into a fuel pool and you can just make out the tops of all of these so all those little squares like you see there that's basically what you're seeing all those little tops lined up uh and, and this thing is being lowered down into there by machine although with the 20 or whatever feet of water it is here that blocks that effectively blocks even that massive amount of radiation release that's in there and you can't even imagine how much radiation is in there but the the water blocked it and so you could if you were so inclined walk along the uh the edge of the pool no running in the pool uh and uh well there you have it so okay but anyway you wouldn't be harmed all right and so that's the fabrication of the fuel and to get to the last point we you, you learned about the fission and the thing i made before and so the fuel is used in the nuclear reactor i think a um i know that the fuel is changed every 18 months and every uh, i think you're, a particular pellet will go through three cycles so they change out a third of it every uh, 18 months and so 36 40 54 54 months uh so that about four and a half years uh, a fuel pellet will be in there and i could be getting that wrong but and then what you're left with are the fission products and we're not going to have that much time if we were doing a five day a week class we'd spend three two or three days on just the fission products and talking about them but just to give you a brief look, the idea is that if uranium is number 92, when you crack it like an egg, the, the pieces aren't exactly in half. They break off into different elements. And uh, so if you think about it, if uh, what's barium, number 56, 56 of those protons are in one piece, and that leaves 36 protons in the other piece, that's barium and krypton. Those aren't the only pieces that can be created. Uh, strontium and xenon uh, is another another thing that could happen. There's a lot of there's a lot of different combinations because the egg doesn't always crack exactly the same way, but it does crack. It does. Uh, and another thing that can happen is that um, there's a lot of intermediates in this, and this is some nuclear chemistry here, and I'm not going to get it all out for you, but you can end up with something bigger, the the nucleus absorbing particles and in that messy fission process and uh one of the unfissioned uranium takes on two more protons and becomes plutonium which is number 94 plutonium is an uh, a, an artificial element that's only created by this but it's also bad guys uh plutonium is a is the most poisonous substance ounce for ounce in all of the world as far as we know because well, a lot of reasons, but one of them is that plutonium is a perfect mimic for calcium. And so if you get plutonium in your system, the if it's going around your bloodstream and it gets to, let's say it's going through the caniculi of your bones uh, and it needs some calcium, it's like, I'm calcium. And your body's like, cool, here's some calcium. And now you have plutonium in your bones. I think that's all you have to say to know that that's not good. And so anyway, this is why these nuclear, well, it is, it is a uh, nuclear waste. Nuclear wastes are clearly dangerous and they are for a long time. We haven't talked about half-lives again, another topic we're not going to get to talk too much about, but a half-life is the amount of time it takes for a radioactive element for half of it to decay into something else that's uh, more stable. And so the half-life for half of any sample of, of plutonium is, I think, 20,000 years. And you have to go 10 half-lives before it's considered gone. Some even say 20. That's, what, 400,000 years, right? Two to 400,000 years. Uh, so the wastes are a thing. And actually, let me go to your reading here, uh, if I still have it up. That's, right, here's the whole thing, right? And as you go through the part, the fuel fabrication and the fissioning in the reactor, um, everything stored temporarily um, on site, either underwater in a fuel pool or in dried casks. Uh, er, the, there is no intermediate place. They show it going somewhere else. Actually, it's all still stored on site. 
every there's 103 nuclear reactors in the United States uh, for power, and they all 103 of them have their waste on site. There is no final place. There was an idea of creating what was called final deposition geologic disposal of moderate and high level waste in an underground system that was supposed to be created where you could park that stuff and it was geologically inactive, meaning earthquakes, hydrologically inactive, meaning water, and that it would stay that way for the requisite, you know, it's actually much longer than the 200,000 years because there's some things that are dangerous for a longer time. But even then, People were skeptical. Nobody wanted it in their state. And even Nevada, which is you know, was picked for it, was uh, fought so hard against it that the thing's been shelved. And there's a lot of other issues to talk about with it, but I'm not going to uh, get into that with you right now because that's just another part of the cycle. Another thing to mention is that there is uh, this thing, this other little arrow that goes off here, which is called spent fuel reprocessing. And the plutonium and uh, other things, first of all, most of the uranium isn't used in that fuel pellet when it isn't fissioned because what happens is as it's fissioned, I don't know why I'm going like this, but on the outside is where the reaction happens. And as they react, they create a coating that's impenetrable to the neutrons. And so the um, eventually the the pellet with only 1% of its potential uranium is actually not able to produce, uh, only 1% actually fissioned is not able to produce power anymore uh, because it's got this coating on it. And so reprocessing uh, does the same thing, kind of crushes it all down, puts, gets the stuff you want in the acid, carries it away, reprocesses it. Uh, We used to do that here in America. They still do it in other places and we don't do it anymore. It's a very messy process. We stopped doing it. In France, they even do things like uh, reprocess uh, uranium and plutonium and turn it into glass that is then stored because it can't like uh, leach out and things like that. But anyway, that's the idea of the nuclear fuel cycle. I'm going to say thank you very much for watching this, and uh, I appreciate your time. I'm going to stop now, and uh, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.